articles, papers that really influenced me on this issue is an opening to a very famous tafsir of the Qur'an in Urdu. It's called Tadabur al-Qur'an by the late Amin Ahsan Islahi rahimahullah. And Amin Ahsan Islahi, before he wrote Tadabur al-Qur'an, he wrote a, a booklet called Mabadi al Tadabur al-Qur'an. Prerequisites to reflecting on the Qur'an. Whenever you study a subject, there are what? Prerequisites. If you're going to go into Accounting 201, you better have taken one already. Accounting 101. If you're going to go and read 4th grade English, you better already know 3rd grade English. There are prerequisites. And he very eloquently argues that in the study or appreciating the Qur'an, there are two sets, two groups of prerequisites. On the one hand, you have academic prerequisites. And on the other hand, you have psychological prerequisites. Um, see if you remember. What kinds of prerequisites are there? <laughs> academic and? He, he separates the two. He separates the two. He says, let me tell you about the academic prerequisites. The Arabic language is an academic prerequisite. Knowing the context of revelation is an academic prerequisite. Understanding the traditional tafasir, what, what our scholars have said in the past about these ayat, the linguistic analysis, the, the shari'i ahkam, the rulings that have been derived from it. All of that literature and scholarship and all of these things, they boil down to academic prerequisite. You can study those things and become a scholar of the Qur'an and not just you, a non-Muslim can do that too. A non-Muslim can fulfill the academic prerequisites and become a top-notch scholar of the Qur'an. As a matter of fact, about 12 years ago, I was in Chicago listening to a speech by a non-Muslim. A non-Muslim was invited to, I still remember the foundation masjid in Chicago, a professor of Islamic studies from Hartford Se Se uh, Seminary in Connecticut. And he came and he spoke for 20 minutes. And when he opened, he said, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَانِ الرَّحِيمِ أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يُكَذِّبُ بِالدِّينِ He recited Surah Al-Ma'ul in perfect tajweed, white guy. Perfect tajweed, not Muslim. And once he was done reciting, off the top of his head, he compared eight different classical tafasir of the first ayah. Ibn Kathir says this, and two centuries before him, Fulan and Fulan said this about this ayah, and he's quoting the original Arabic text. Most of us sitting in the audience are like, whoa, that guy? And even one uncle from the audience couldn't help himself, raised his hand, and the question has a session. Got a, why aren't you Muslim? <laughs> I mean, the, you say, oh no, come on, that's why I put him on the spot? But actually, everybody was thinking that. If you know so much, if you know so much, most Muslims, I bet you no Muslim in the audience knew as much as that guy did. It's incredible. He met what kind of prerequisites? Academic. But psychological prerequisites are something else. There's something else. And a lot of times when we try to study the Qur'an and understand the Qur'an or try to fulfill the prerequisites of the Qur'an, like the study of the Arabic language, whether you're studying it for 10 days, or you're studying it for 10 months, or you're studying it for 10 years. You know what happens a lot of times? We keep our attention on the academic prerequisites and our attention goes away from the psychological prerequisites. They're the ones that get ignored. Because they're not mentioned in the book of Ulum al-Qur'an. They're not mentioned under Ulum al-Tafseel. Here are the attitudes that you have to have. Here is the mindset you must have. All that's mentioned is understand Asbab al-Nuzul, understand Asbahkam al-Tajweed, understand the Qira'at, understand the language, understand this, that all the academic prerequisites are listed. But none of the spiritual, none of the psychological prerequisites are mentioned. They're not listed. I mean, we're not given that essentially. We're just told to have the right intention. But what does that mean? Let's dig deeper a little bit. Let's build the right attitude. So now, I've shared with you when it comes to academics we understand, but when it comes to attitudes, either the Qur'an is there to bless our gatherings, or to protect us, or to be recited when somebody dies, or somebody gets sick. That's our attitude, that's when the Qur'an comes in handy for us. Otherwise it's an enemy book, it's just a knowledge book. It doesn't really have much to do with my personal life. We have to figure out a reconfiguration. Let's talk about this reconfiguration now. The first thing, all of you know, Quran is a book of fill in the blank. Quran is a book of everybody here knows that. I don't think 
any Muslim sitting in this audience doesn't know that. Quran is a book of guidance. What's the Arabic word for guidance? Huda. The Quran calls itself, of its many names, guidance. When I recited from the beginning, Inna hadha al-Qur'ana yahdi al-Latiyyah. This Qur'an guides. You've heard tons of times, Qur'an is guidance, Qur'an is guidance, Qur'an is guidance. But I, today I want to talk to you about what does that mean? Just in simple language. No academic language, no quotations from scholarly works. Just in simple language. What does that mean? When outside of the religious context, outside of the religious context, when do you use the word guidance? Have you ever used the word guidance without talking about religion? When? When you're driving. Could you offer me some guidance, some directions? You get guidance from your GPS. You can get guidance from the gas station. Right? Where else do you use guidance? High schoolers. Now, when have you heard the word guidance? Guidance, guidance counselor. When do you go to a guidance counselor? I don't know what to do. I want to be successful. I want to have a really good career. I'm not sure what to do. What college should I apply to? What major should I do? I can't figure it out. Can you help me? Can you give me some guidance? Guidance usually has to do with your future. Number one, you're going to go to college in your future, you're going to see a guidance counselor. You want to end up at some destination in your career. Just like when you're driving, you want to end up at the right destination. You pull over and you ask for some guidance. Now let me ask you this. When you go, you're lost. You're trying to get to the airport. DFW is kind of hard to miss. It's bigger than most cities. But anyway, you're lost. You can't find the airport. You get lost. You pull over at a gas station. You're asking for directions. Now, when you ask for directions and they give it to you, do you need it again? Once you got the directions and you understood them, do you need the directions again? No. Now you go. You don't need to be told over and over again, do you? And if somebody tries to tell you, hey, no, no, take a left here and take a right there, and you say, no, I already know, I already asked. I know I have to take a left here, and I know I have to take a right there. Have you ever driven a car with somebody who wants to give you directions even though the GPS is working? <laughs> and their directions are the exact same thing? You know what, you should take a right here. Now take a left. You ever done that? You know how annoying that gets? And maybe out of respect, you don't say anything, or maybe you just turn and say, bro, I know, I'm following her. There's usually a lady, right? But the only lady you listen to is that. <laughs> but anyhow, when you know something and you're told again, you say, come on, I already know this. I don't need this from you. I don't need this guidance from you. I already got it. If you already went, for example, for a financial advisor, a financial guide, a financial counselor, you went to him, he helped you sort out some finances, figure out where you should put your money, what investments you should make, what, you, what kind of account you should open. You got it all figured out. Then you don't need the same thing over again from you. You don't. And if somebody tries to give it to you, your first response is, no thanks, I already know. Your response is what? I already know. So it seems to me that in life, guidance has a lot to do with knowledge. In life. <coughs> guidance has a lot to do with what? Knowledge. I went to get guidance at the gas station because I didn't have what? Knowledge. And now that I have knowledge, I don't need to get it again. I have it, I have it. In all of life, we assume knowledge to be the same as guidance. Guidance to be the same as knowledge. But when it comes to the Quran, that formula doesn't work. That same formula I just shared with you, that knowledge and guidance can be the same thing, it does not work when we come to Allah's will. That's the first thing we have to understand. Someone who acquired a lot of knowledge of the Qur'an, does that guarantee that they have guidance from the Qur'an? No. Clearly there's a difference now between knowledge and guidance. We have to understand this difference. We have to figure this difference out. And by the way, in any other guidance, you don't need it over and over again. But in this guidance, by mandate of Allah Azza wa Jal, by the most fixed sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, every few hours, you and I stand in front of Allah and say, give me guidance. What do we say? What are the words? <laughs> if guidance was the same as knowledge, you wouldn't have to ask for it over and over again, because knowledge is done. You graduated, you know it already. The fact that 
we have to go ask over and over again must mean there is something else here. Something that I am in the danger of losing between Dhuhr and Asr. And between Asr and Maghrib, I might lose it again. So I have to go back and ask again. And between Maghrib and Isha, I have to ask again. Because I might lose it. Knowledge is not something you lose easily. You, once you know, you know. Two plus two is four. It's four. I know it. It's done. But the guidance of the Quran, the guidance of Allah, you can't keep it. It's not the same as knowledge. So the, the way I want to put this together for you first, is that when it comes to our religion, when it comes to our correct attitudes towards this book, we say that knowledge is a key. It's a key. But it's not the whole thing. It's a part of it. Knowledge is a part of guidance. We need knowledge, but it's not all of it. There's something more. And it's something so pricey and so expensive that even the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in every single raka'ah that he ever prayed, asked Allah for it. The fact that he had to ask so many times for it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, means it's something extremely valuable and none of us should ever assume that we have it. We shouldn't assume that we have it. Why shouldn't we assume that we have it? Because you don't ask for something you already have. Isn't that the case? <coughs> if I ask you for some water, like I asked for Zahim, what does that mean? I'm thirsty. If I ask for water, it means I'm thirsty. When you ask Allah for guidance, what is it supposed to mean? You're thirsty. If I ask for food, it means what? I'm hungry. If we're asking for guidance, it means there is, just like the body runs out of drink, the body runs out of food, and it needs nutrition. Something inside of us is running out. Like every few hours I have to drink, every few hours I'm supposedly running out of something, and I have to go ask for it again. I need it as importantly as I need oxygen and food and drink, and that thing I need is what? Is guidance. And, I, and the only one who can give it to me is Allah Azza wa Jalla. And the only real way to ask Him is to first make wudu, then face Him, and leave everything else aside, and stand in front of Him, leaving the whole world behind you, and then ask Him in this proper way. Because you can't just ask for it. It's not that cheap. You know how you ask your parents for stuff? Can I have five dollars? Nobody asks for five anymore, right? They don't, or your kids don't even know they make money that small. They ask for a twenty at the minimum. But they don't even make eye contact. They're just sitting on their phone. Hey dad, can I have 20 bucks? You know? And I'm like, when they're done, uh, Dad, excuse me, I thought I asked you for 20 dollars. <laughs> There's something wrong with your attitude when you're asking, right? Is there a difference? Let me ask you so I can make this point clear. Is there a difference between somebody asking you for water that just came into your house and they're okay? They ask you for some water. Or somebody who's dying of thirst and they ask you for water. Is there a difference in the way they ask? There's a different way to ask, right? Someone who thinks if you give me water, it's nice, but if you don't give it to me, I'll be okay. Their attitude is, and if you don't give it to them, then you'll, they'll be fine, they'll forget about it too. <laughs> but somebody who's dying of thirst, they will ask, and once they ask, what's happening? When they're done asking, what do they do? waiting impatiently. And when they don't see it after 10 seconds, what do they do? They ask again. Could you, could you get that, did you forget about that water? Could you get that water again? The way in which we ask Allah for guidance is very, very telling. It's a very good indication of how desperate we are for guidance. And if the way you and I ask Allah for guidance, is If the way you ask Allah for guidance is not desperate, if the way I ask Allah for guidance is not desperate, you know what that proves to me? I don't have to prove it to anybody else. It proves to me that I am not really that desperately in need of guidance. If you send it to me, well and good. If not, I'll be, I'm doing okay. Everything's fine. The first thing that has to change is our desperation for guidance. We have to feel a desperation for guidance. This, is, this thing is so valuable, Allah doesn't just give it to whoever, he want, whoever wants it. 
You don't just casually ask for it. You have to have a certain way of asking. There's a certain way you and I have to build. And that has to happen in what institution? In Salat. In Salat, we have to stand and ask Allah for guidance in the most desperate way. That, that attitude needs to be there. It's hard. It's hard for me and it's hard for you. I'm not saying I've, I've mastered it, not even close. We're all in the same boat here. This reminder is as applicable to you as it is to me. You know, nobody's in a better position than anybody else. This is something we all personally really, really need to work on. Let's take another step now. The first thing was desperation. We have to be desperate and we, and intense in how we ask for guidance. But what is guidance? An easy definition. I know I really need it. I know I should ask for it a lot. I know I can't own it. I can be given it, but it can be taken away at any moment. It's a treasure that you can't, once you earn it, you can't keep it. It can go away. So you have to keep asking for it. Muslim or not, doesn't matter. But then what is it? Essentially, guidance boils down, for you and me, practically speaking, guidance boils down to choices. That's what it boils down to. Between Doha and Asa, I'm driving back to the office. There's a billboard, I have a choice to look or not to look. There's a song playing on the radio, I have a choice to listen or not to listen. There's a friend calling backbiting about another friend, I have a choice to carry on the conversation or end the conversation. There's a fight going on between me and my in-laws. I have a choice to end the fight or keep the fight going. Keep the, keep the fuels of my anger burning. All of my life boils down to choices. Do or don't do. Look or don't look. Text or don't text. Post or don't post. Email back or don't email back. Watch the video or don't watch the video. Go to the movie or not go to the movie. It's all choices. Yes or no? And you know what? Guidance is practically right before you make any choice, you turn back to Allah and say, what's the right choice? Could you guide me? Could you guide me to the right choice? And then every choice you make and I make, we turn back to Allah and we seek His counsel and then we make a choice. That's guidance. Do choices happen just once a day? How often do we make choices? Literally every second. Every second we're making choices. When do we need guidance then? Every second. Every second we need guidance. Is it easy to forget that we need guidance? In a lecture you will be told you need guidance. In a book you will be told you will need guidance. But in life, when you're not sitting in the masjid, when you're, when you're at work, when you're hanging out with friends, when you're on campus, when you're in the car, you know, when you're at the hotel, when you're in different places, that's when it will be proven whether you seek guidance or not. The second distinction I want to make for you, the first was knowledge and guidance are two different things. Remember that? The second distinction I want to make for you is being Muslim and being guided are two different things. They're not the same thing. Alhamdulillah, Allah guided all of us to Islam. Alhamdulillah. That does not mean that we are guaranteed guidance. That means we made our first guided decision. Guidance, or, guidance boils down to what I said? It boils down to choices. Becoming a Muslim or being a Muslim is one good choice. It's not the only choice in life. It's one choice. And that good choice of becoming a Muslim opens door, the doors to all the other good choices in life. But that does not mean you'll always be making the right decisions. And I'll always be making the right decisions. Now, the two points I've made thus far is we have to be desperate for guidance and we need it all the time. And we can't own it. That's the basic points I've made with you so far. What is the relationship between this and the Qur'an? The Qur'an is basically my counselor, my advisor, my source for guidance. I recite the Qur'an and I'm not thinking, but you know, knowledge is one thing. I should understand the grammar, I should understand the language, I should understand the tahasi and all of that stuff. But at the end of it all, I'm learning all of that only for one reason. I want to make the right choices. You know what happens to people that study religion? Not just our religion, any religion. And this is true of our people too. 
Tafsir. When we study religion, we study fiqh, we study aqidah, we study Quran, we study tafsir, we study religion and we forget that the reason we're studying it is to make the right choices. It just becomes learning for the sake of learning. That's a, that's a major problem. The reason we are learning is to make better choices. So if you've been studying the Quran, brother or sister, and yet your relationships at home are just horrible. They're horrible. You've been studying the Qur'an and you're still as lazy as you were before you memorized Surah Al-Baqarah and after you memorized it. You are still as mean, you are still as impatient, you're, you're still as oblivious as you were before, then the only difference between before and after is the difference between a parrot that memorizes certain lines and after is still a parrot. You can be a really bad person without knowing Arabic and you can still be a really bad person after knowing Arabic. Arabic doesn't make you a good person. Arabic is on the academics. Academ evil people can be academic too. <laughs> it's the other side, it's the attitudes. The attitudes that have to ch experience a change. So I want to talk now about the Qur'an's particular role as guidance. We already talked about the importance of guidance itself. But the Qur'an's role in guidance. Qur'an is supposed to be recited every single day, multiple times in our salat, so that Allah gives us a sermon, He gives us some guidance. And if you are of the Muslims that are sitting in this audience, and probably that's the case for most of you, that when you recite the Qur'an, or when the Qur'an is recited to you in prayer, you don't understand it, then you need to compensate. You need to compensate by studying the Qur'an outside of salat. The original intention in the religion, the original idea of the religion is, your relationship with the Qur'an is supposed to be maintained in, in Salah. But if that's not happening for you, and you don't understand what's happening in Salah, then you have to compensate for that until you learn better. Until you learn better, you have to become a student of the Qur'an. So now my advice to you is, what does it mean that you and I are becoming students of the Qur'an for the purpose of guidance? Students of the Qur'an for the purpose of guidance. Number one thing, priority. My teacher used to give this example to me. He used to say, if I was to pay you one dollar, give you, he hands me a shovel, and I'll pay you one dollar, dig a hole here, ten feet deep. How long would it take me to dig a hole ten feet deep? The whole day. How much is he gonna pay me? One dollar. Then he takes another student. He says, dig a hole. How, how deep? <coughs> 10 feet deep. I'll give you $50,000. Who's gonna dig faster? Is there a difference in the digging? Who's gonna take a break and who's not gonna take a break? Who's gonna say, I got no time, man, I'm busy right now. And who's gonna say, hold on, can I do this later? I got a phone call. You see, there's a difference in attitude, right? Why is there a difference? They're both doing the same job. Why is there a difference? Tell me. You get something more out of it. You get something more out of it. If you get something more out of it, it will get your attention, it will get your time, it will get your effort. Isn't that true? The fact that you guys are cramming the night before the exam. Medical students become medical patients before the exam. You know. They study so hard. The fact that you know, you're an accountant, the, the, you don't even come home from night. Tax season. When you're running the store and it's Christmas break or you know Black Friday or Green Thursday, whatever it is. You gotta run the store. This is the most important time of the year. When you have the image, the green card appointment at 8 a.m. and you show there up show up there at 9 p.m. the night before. It's important, it deserves your time, your attention. So it gets the time and the attention. The fact that the Quran does not get my time and attention, the fact that it doesn't get my time and attention, that is proof to me, I don't think that it has something to offer me. My life is fulfilled as it is. I have everything I need. I have a TV, I have a PlayStation, I have an internet connection. 